is the Camp Baker Show. We are live and it is the 21st of March. How are you great people all doing? Hope you've all had a lovely weekend. Time to refresh, buy some new tinfoil and a full week of KBS and woo and news and fun ahead. And I can't think of a better way to start any week than tonight's special guest, friend of the show, Ben Emlyn jones is going to be back with us. And you know myself and Johnny, we absolutely love Ben and the information that he brings with him. And that's why you out there have all made him a firm favourite as well. But more of Ben in just a moment. Right after my show tonight, my brother, Joe Joseph, he has lined up yet another amazing show for all of you. He is going to be joined by the brains and the beauty behind Truth Stream Media. Aaron and Melissa Dykes are going to be live. And trust me, folks, you do not want to miss this show. So don't go anywhere after KBS or I'll set the whistler on you. And talking of the whistler, how are you doing, man? Fantastic, Kev. Looking forward to this tonight. The Monday show, Kev. I love this one. It kicks off the week. Just fantastic. And what a guest we've got. Exactly. And, you know, we like to have a bit of fun here on KBS, no matter what topics we cover. And that's what makes us kind of popular, Johnny, so I'm told. And you were looking <laughs> at tonight's topics and we're going reptilians. We're going Paul, Paul. And you were looking at some of the Beatles tracks of the past, weren't you? Yeah, Kev. I mean, we're going to be talking about Paul McCartney. Um, and all I know is that he left the house one day looking for Eleanor Rigby. Now, he scoured the city looking for her down Abbey Road and through Strawberry Fields, which actually took him forever. Then he saw her standing there. He said, get back. There's going to be a revolution. And he worked hard on this. In fact, eight days a week. But then he started going mad. I think he was taking acid, a bit of a day tripper, and saying daft things like, I am the walrus, Kev. Do you know what I mean? I don't know what it is. But as far as I know, he's back in the USSR. I know last time that I seen him, Johnny, he was saying, oh, bloody, oh, bloody. I don't know what's (laughs) happened to him. But more of all that, just a moment, brilliant whistles. And one guy who has made a really big impact on myself and Johnny is Ben Emlyn Jones. Now, just a few words about Ben. He's the guy behind HPANWO, Hospital Porters Against the New World Order. Now, if you haven't checked out Ben before, where have you been? I urge you all to do so the next opportunity you get. And you can find his work over at hpanwo.blogspot.co.uk. And he is, his website is dedicated to the latest news, views and reviews from the world of government cover-ups, ghosts, UFOs, hospital porters, paranormal investigation, hidden knowledge, forbidden history and archaeology, chemtrails, and there's just far much more for me to mention. So, who better to talk about all of this than the man himself? Ben, welcome back to the earlier Kev Baker Show. Thanks, Kevin. It's great you reminded me about the time because um, I've already missed one show and I almost missed another one because, of course, the American time is different. So uh, great to be here with you. Absolutely fantastic. And, And, you know, just before we launch into tonight's brilliant topics, I cannot wait. You're obviously still working on your book, Ben. You told us a little bit about how you're getting on last time. Where are you now? Are you almost done, sir? Oh, yes, that book, that book. I'm still writing that book. I'm actually making good progress, um, Kev. I really am, I'm pleased to say. And I've been really working hard on it. It's really taking shape. I've reached a kind of mi- milestone in the writing of the book. And um, while well, I'm still working, I-, I can't make actual predictions about how long this is going to take, but um, I'm pleased with the progress I've made. So um, I'm really looking forward to actually getting it done, getting it out there so you guys can read it. Excellent stuff, and you know... I can't wait to read this book. I've seen the teaser that you've got on the website. And, of course, people can check that out where, Ben? Um, it's actually on the YouTube, my YouTube, YouTube. channel, which is uh, – it's there's links on the main Hapanmo site, which is like a portal to the rest of the things I do. But uh, the, the YouTube channel is called Ben, B-E-N, the J-R Porter, T-H-E-J-R-P-O-R-T-E-R. So check me out there. Excellent stuff. Now then, tonight, we're going to get into reptilians. But before that, 
one of the longest running conspiracies possibly that's out there is this whole debate over whether Paul McCartney actually died back in 1966 yeah. and was replaced with a stooge. Ben, talk to us, Matt. Yeah, this is really um, a peculiar one. I mean, it's not new, like you said. It's, it, it's a fact, it's an idea that goes back almost 50 years now. And it's, um, so it's something that came up, it's come up several times in my, in my research and the way I look around. And um, I actually wrote about this in 2008. I've sort of changed my mind a bit since then. But this was all reignited in my life because um, a friend of mine, um, someone you may have heard of before, actually, uh, Dr. Nick Collistrom, the researcher from London, he uh, has been doing a series of um, events in Oxford, and I've been filming them. And um, last Tuesday, he did another one. He did one um, which, in which he was talking about his own research and the book he wrote, which is all about this whole idea. And the basic premise here we're talking about is, is to do with the Beatles. The Beatles, of course, are the world's greatest band, but they're more than that. I mean, they're a major cultural phenomenon, I think, of a quite unique type. <clears throat> I mean, they're still big today. I think they'll always be big. But um, You know, Ben, some people even say that they were used by the Tavistock to bring about some social engineering and change at the time. Yeah, well, this is actually what I want to get into because I think this, this is an element that Nick, I think, is aware of. Um, but this, I think, puts another dimension on it because, to be honest, I'm, what I'm going to talk about now, I'm undecided on. I'm on I, um, I think there's evidence to suggest it may be real. There's also some serious questions and um, problems with the theory. So I'm, I'm really not decided on this, and that, that's, I can't make my mind up on it just yet. But I think... Nick Collistrom has reopened this case. There's no doubt about it that his his own research has reignited the questions that uh, some people I know don't agree with. I know I've, I've had discussions with people in the truth movement. A lot of people really do not go along with this at all. They've even compared it to the flat earth and things like that. Um, and I don't know if Mark Sargent is listening. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. Greg, Mark but, was on before us here. Absolutely. Yeah. What a topic Spoken that to is, Mark. and you know. I yeah. can't say I'm totally into that myself. I'm more of a spherical guy, but see some of the arguments that they present. It's very hard to actually <laughs> contest them. Yeah, but the thing about the thing about Paul is, is <clears throat> it's, there is um, it's, it covers several elements. There's, for instance, some records of Paul singing and of his photographs and film made of him because, of course, he's one of the most photographed men on earth. And there's a massive amount of material in the media in, of, to do with Paul McCartney, dating right back from when the Beatles started to the present day. And um, researchers like Nick, and Nick is, is one of the few British researchers who's really got on top of this question, because most of the other researchers are all American. Um, he's basically collected some various pictures of Paul to suggest that he did undergo a major... In, in, he Firstly, he, he sort of disappeared for a few months, and there wasn't really, there's not really much to be said about him for a couple, about two or three months. Then he reappears again, and he's undergone a major image change. And um, now what the theory has happened is he actually died in a car crash. Some other people say it was murder, maybe it was an accident. And that he, um, Brian Epstein, the management and the team, um, working alongside, there must have been some state involvement in this too, decided to uh, bring in somebody else to play Paul. In other words, this would be, this was kind of, an, a, like you say, a stooge, an imposter. This was man essentially an actor pretending to be Paul McCartney. Can we say it was the first crisis actor, Ben? Oh. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe. That's a good one, yeah. I mean, obviously, th this, this is an incredible claim, but there is certain questions that, may, that lends it credibility. There's also an attempt, I think, perhaps to to give out subtle clues, as if somebody within the Beatles team, maybe one of the band members or maybe someone else within their team, were actually trying to give out little clues of, about what had happened. Um, either consciously or subconsciously, there's clues in some of the song lyrics. Um, there's um, there's uh, clues in, in the artwork, especially, I think, is very interesting. And the question, I mean, there's all sorts of questions that come up with this, Kev. I mean, how, why, things like that. I mean... When Nick was there, and, and you can see if you watch the movie I put on my YouTube channel about this, because I include my own commentary on this, but the, the entire lecture that Nick gave is recorded, and it includes the question and answer session. You, firstly, I mean, who could replace Paul? It would have to be somebody who looks like him, who is very musically talented, somebody who's left-handed, or at least played the guitar left-handed, and had no 
public image at that point. They had no commercial success. They had no pub. They had, were not famous themselves, and they were willing to give up their life to become somebody else. Now, this is one of the people. One of the people in the audience actually brought this up when Nick was talking about this, and it sounds like it's a good question. I mean, there's there's many other answers you could give. I mean, one of those is, of course, that Paul McCartney was was living an enviable lifestyle. He uh, is the highest paid highest paid musician in history. Um, he, of course, there's all kinds of those kinds of perks. Some people who might like the fame and fortune would go for it. Um, the other question is, I mean, you've got to also look at things such as spies. Now, after the Cold War ended, it was revealed that a large number of sp- the spies in the intelligence agencies on both sides in the Cold War, but it seems like the, the Soviets were better at this than the Americans, uh, they had people living literally new lives undercover in the enemy country. These people would, would speak the language. If they may be Russian people who learned to speak perfect, they used to learn to speak perfect English with a Texan accent or whatever, and they would be another person with a false name living in that country. And Ben, and some, listeners, years. some listeners love it. Some absolutely detest it. I, I always <laughs> like to give examples of popular culture. And there's a really popular TV show called The Americans, and this shows exactly what you're talking about, selected at a very early age over in the old Soviet Union and basically groomed to be one of these sleepers that you're talking about. And they are essentially Americans. And just recently, didn't we have a good-looking red-haired spy caught over in America as part of a Russian team? These yeah. things are going on right now. Oh, it's still, you can imagine it's still going on today. I mean, um, there's a lot of conf- there's still a lot of tension between um, the USA and Russia, and uh, you can bet they're still at it. And of course, the Russians, as you say, are, are really, really good at this sort of thing. So you can bet that they're pro- if, if Paul, for the fake Paul, Fall, as he is known, if he is not who he seems to be, he wouldn't be the only person, I believe, living in the world under a false identity, not by a long way. Um, so. You know, despite the fact that I, I, there are flaws within this theory, I, I have to say it is plausible. It is possible. The reason on, well, on the subject of, of, of why, why they did it, and that's a good question as well, and this came up during the question and answer session, and Nick did sort of feel these questions quite well. Um, people might say, well, it's, it, could, it could be something as sinister as the fact that the, the four Beatles – were essentially a mind control operation by the Tavistock Institute. It could be something like that. Or it could simply be that it could be for economic reasons. I mean, see, Nick has actually looked into this, and he said that the Beatles, of course, they were more than just a band. They were actually quite an important part of Britain's industry at that time, believe it or not. They, they actually, they were so successful, they actually did affect the gross domestic product of this country. Wow. Uh, on quite considerably, and there may be certainly, maybe certain reasons, purely financial, for them to want to keep the Beatles as they were. And um, of course, could ben, be that- there's people, and I mean, when I first looked at this, I was quite mm, dismissive, and I thought really good marketing. It's all a gimmick. But then when you start looking into, it, I'm like you, I'm totally undecided, and I keep an open mind on it. A lot yeah. of people point to things like the bass guitar wreath on the Sergeant Pepper's. Album. Yes, there are several clues. Um, the Sgt. Pepper album is full of all kinds of clues. For instance, there's, there's encoded messages on the drum, which, uh, and which apparently says something different if you put a mirror up to it. Nick has all these details in his book. There's also the, um, it looks like a, there's like a grave dug underneath and you can just about, you can see like a shape of a guitar in the flowers. There's an, one of the most, there's two other albums which are particularly interesting. Um, one is Abbey Road. Abbey Road, of course, is famous for its cover, which was taken on Abbey Road in London on a zebra crossing. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's, you go there today, the fans are keep, keep photographing themselves going over the zebra crossing. But the actual photograph on the album cover was taken in August of 1968, and it was done very, very quickly. Um, basically, someone went, they went out, they got a policeman to hold up the traffic, and the guy got on a stepladder, the photographer, and took pictures of the Fab Four walking across the zebra crossing. Now, um, they're wearing costumes that were designed by someone called Tommy Nutter, apparently, which is, I wonder if that's a pseudonym for somebody else, maybe someone in the Beatles team or even even one of the band members. But um, if you look at it, if, if you look at it, you'll see that um, John, who's leading them on the right, he's wearing this big, long, flowing white suit, which does have a cool sort of ecclesiastical feel to it, like the sort of thing a vicar would wear. 
The next guy along, of course, the next guy along is Ringo, who's wearing uh, a black suit with black trousers, uh, black shoes, as an undertaker or mourner would wear. At the far end is George, who's in scruffy denims and casual shoes, like a grave digger. And then, of course, the second, the second character along is Paul himself, who's barefoot. He's barefoot. He's he's wearing this suit, which looks almost like a one-piece grey outfit, like a shroud, and he's barefoot, like a corpse. And he's holding a cigarette in his hand, which is bad for him. So it, 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 the question has to be asked, is this a funeral in effigy? I know it's a long shot, but it's it's an example of the kind of um, encoded messages you get in some of the the works of the Beatles. Another one is the uh, the album The album before that was um, what's known as the White Album. And it's called that because it's called known as the White Album because it's completely white. It's blank white. And its proper title is simply The Beatles. And people say, well, that's, there's nothing much in that. But it, the inner sleeve is very different because the inner sleeve is like a kind of poster, folded poster thing. I don't know how many people remember old vinyl records. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they, became, they used to have like um, a big card, card sleeve that used to come in and there'd be an inner sleeve to protect the actual grooves on the record. Now, the inner sleeve is covered with photographs. Uh, it's the ob- opposite of the, the outer cover. Um, photographs of the band. But the most interesting photograph of all is just a tiny little one in the bottom left corner. It shows a man. It's a rather fuzzy, small pocket photograph, or passport size photo, of a, a man wearing, dark, wearing glasses, and he just looks like an ordinary guy. And um, the question is, who is that? And, well, it could be that this is... I forgot actually where this where all the details come from, but Nick, it's in Nick's book. So this is actually a man who today is known as Paul McCartney. That's an actual picture of Fall before he became the started playing the role of Paul McCartney. Holy and it's smokes, been man! Album. Yeah, if that's the case, yeah. Now, um, you all- would you would, wouldn't you, if you were doing that kind of like absolute illusion of something yeah. i think they would kind of wave it in your face at times ben there may be many reasons why they would give out subtle clues like this it could be subconscious or it could be deliberate it could be that somebody inside wants to let the public know what's happening of course the skeptics will say well the beatles were, were kind of milking this and they were having a bit of a laugh about it and they they even used this idea because this idea came out quite early on it it actually emerged not long after paul was supposed to have died in 1966 and it was already, by the late 60s, it was already going around on the radio and TV. And Paul appeared on the front cover of Life magazine with Linda and the kids at their house in Scotland saying, look, I'm here, I'm alive and well. But it, mm, again, that could be a double bluff. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, Johnny Whistles, let's get you in here because I could listen to Ben going on about this all night. <laughs> I've got clues of my own, but your thoughts on this. You're really big into your music, John. Well, Kev, I was a big Beatles fan and... When I heard this, um, obviously, do you know what I mean, later in life, but Kev, I totally dismissed it straight off the bat, totally dismissed it. But now, because I've spoke to people who who are actually, who know about these things that they do actually go on, there's clones of certain people that are out there, we know that. We also have Aaron and Melissa Dykes, who put out a fantastic video today showing you just how easy that is to do. Exactly. And they must have been doing it, Kev, for I don't know how long, if and, they've perfected it like this. And Melissa and Aaron, they're going to be on right after this to talk about something called Face to Face. But, yeah, Ben, I mean, nowadays, who only knows what we're watching half the time? It could be yeah. all CGI, but I do think there's some weight to this. And one, I do. one character I came across who is a possible fall. His name was Billy Shears. Now, he was a lookalike at the time, but there's actually a reference to Billy Shears on the Sgt. Pepper's album. Yeah, there's several songs, I think, in in which the the name Billy Shears comes up. And it's about a new band that the Beatles form with a guy called Billy Shears. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's, and there's a book called The Memoirs of Billy Shears, which is quite a rare book. It's difficult to get hold of now. Um, Nick has a copy, which he brought with him to the lecture, and you can see it in the video. But um, there's there's also, I want to bring up another issue, that this is not without precedent. We've already talked about spies taking on fake 
um, identities. But there's also another instance of uh, the media covering up the death of a famous personality and replacing that personality with a double. Now, in this case, this is, this is confirmed, by the way. This has been admitted. But it doesn't, in this case, it doesn't refer to a man. It refers to a dog. But I still think it is, is, significant, it is significant to this case. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Blue Peter, the oh, TV yeah. show Blue Peter. It's a very, very old program. It began in 1958, uh, and it's been running to the present day. Um, and it's always, it, it was, it's always filmed live. That's the thing. They always film it live in the studio. Um, now, they always have animals with them. There's, uh, there's cats, dogs, tortoises, things like that. Now, in, in 1962, they introduced a puppy called Petra. Uh, to be one of the Blue Peter dogs. And they brought the little puppy barking into the studio and they uh, sat in front of the camera with the, um, with the presenters. And, uh, of course, all the children, the little young viewers, saw this little puppy. Um, now, what happened was, um, after that program was broadcast, Petra, she sadly died. And the producers at the BBC realised that they were going to have to come on to next week's show and go live again and uh, tell the heartbreaking news that Petra had gone to that uh, big little kennel oh. in the sky. Oh, yeah, which... I see. I watched John Noakes crying on yeah. the show. Oh, that was over Shep. Yeah, but, I mean, the thing about it, they'd have to do is, this, this was just much earlier, this was 1962, and maybe things were different then, but they'd have to, they'd have to tell the kids that and have the little, little darlings weeping into their after-school tea. Now, um, what they did, what the BBC chose to do is the producers got together and said where would you get that puppy from and they said oh, it was from that pet shop in high street now, go back there and see if they got another one get hold of that dog bring it in and we'll just pretend it's the same dog and you know what they did and they got away with it and they never admitted it for 42 years it was finally they, the bbc came clean in 2004 and they said yes we admit we replaced petra just after she died and, and they never told the kids ever i have got the human equivalent of that more recent and I think we could throw Bin Laden and then the fat Bin Laden into that as well. <laughs> but you know, That's another example, isn't it? Yes. If people think this really is crazy, it might not be a similar... Well, it's similar, sort of. Think of Millie Vanilli. Mm-hmm. There you go. Yeah. Now, it might not be replacing people. However, that is the lens they will go to to market something or to keep something going. And Ben, I think that it's not going to solve the problems of the world obviously but if no, people no. do have some spare time on their hands and they want to get away from the absolute horrid news that goes around on the daily cycle then why not spend an hour looking into this it can do well, no yeah. harm and very interesting it is and also i think the point the, the reason i think this is an important case it may be sort of inconsequential in a way compared to some of the other things we talked about on this program, which are far, far more sinister and um, actually harmful. But the, the, the lesson, I think, is you can be fooled. The, the media, the authorities can fool you to the point where you, the most, one of the most famous men in the world, one of the most adored, one of the most fancied by women, one of the most photographed, can be replaced.